Good morning. Good morning. And thank you for inviting me here today. And especially thank you for inviting me on this day and this year. Because right at this moment, and probably for many months to come, we're passing through a very unique vortex in time. It's unique because it involves three extreme megatrends that are, or soon could be, impacting every aspect of life in the United States. Real estate, the auto industry, presidential elections, jobs, local government, schools, plus your money. And it's especially unusual because it's driven by powerful, unpredictable forces that are beyond our control. Black swans that appear out of dark clouds that swoop down unexpectedly and that land in very strange places. We talked about some black swans at the Marriott Hotel around this time last year. The black swan that attacked the very heart of our nation with great loss of life and treasure, setting off a chain reaction of events that have continued to ricochet through time. The US invasion of Iraq, the fall of Saddam Hussein, the rise of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, the sudden emergence of and global spread of the Islamic State. And now, 12 months since we last spoke, that chain of events has continued with a series of new brutal attacks. Paris, November 15th of last year. Brussels, March 22nd of this year. And here at home, in San Bernardino, California, catching the entire nation by surprise. Plus, the Russian passenger plane shot down over the Sinai. Egypt Air flight from Paris to Cairo, cause still uncertain, search operations still ongoing. And one year ago, we also talked about another black swan event that struck at the very heart of financial markets. It wasn't September 11, 2001. It was September 15, 2008. The Lehman Brothers' failure, again, setting off a chain reaction of events that have continued to ricochet through time. America's deepest recession since the 1930s. America's largest bank failures and rescues of all time. And now, the largest Fed money printing operations the world has ever seen. One year ago, I showed you that despite our problems here in the US, the instability abroad was worse. That's also true today. I showed you how ISIS had expanded throughout the Middle East and beyond. I showed you how many more countries around the world were getting dragged into international wars and conflicts. That's also true today. Plus, I illustrated how those conflicts were helping to drive foreign capital, flight capital, into US assets. And that is also continuing today, with capital flowing from the east into London, then across the Atlantic to New York, not to mention flight capital flowing from Canada and from Latin America. All this continues. But now, we are moving into a new phase, a phase in which the black swan events are beginning to appear more prominently right here in the United States. How will that alter these global money flows? How will that be felt in our community? These are very tough questions, and I'll do my best to address them before we part today. For now, though, let me ask you a big question. What do you think the next major black swan event will be? What do you think the next major black swan event will be? The presidential election. The presidential election? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> Any others? <laughs> Terrorist attack on the U.S. soil. Terrorist attack on the U.S. soil. One more. 
I'm, so, I'm sorry, a Brexit exit from the EU? Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, I apologize. That was a trick question. Because by definition, if we could predict black swan events, they would not be black swan events to begin with. No one can predict black swans. But what we can do is to analyze the setups for black swans. We can study the preconditions that give rise to black swans. Let me give you just three prime examples, three major megatrends that are setups for future black swans. The first one, the black swan setup of the first kind, is in the financial realm. I'm talking about a big bubble, not a housing bubble or a stock market bubble, but another kind of bubble, the money bubble. The big money printing by the US Federal Reserve and the other major central banks around the world that I just showed you in the video. Of course, they don't use money printing presses like they used to in the old days. They do it electronically, but it's the same process. The Fed, along with other central banks around the world, create money out of thin air. They pump that money into the banking system, and then they pray the money will be put to good use. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, so what else is new? This is what they've always done, right? No. This is not what they've always done. And I'm going to prove it to you right now. I'm going to take you back in time to show you how they used to do it. I'll show you how they're doing it now, and then I'll show you why it's dangerous. We go back a half century to the 1960s, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the real threat of a thermonuclear war, the assassination of JFK, stunning the world, raising serious doubts about our nation, the Vietnam War with troop levels more than double the peaks in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. And yet, despite all this, the U.S. Federal Reserve does not print money wildly. The Fed balance sheet, which re reflects printed money, grows slowly and gradually. Well, perhaps you could argue that uh, fundamentally those black swan events of the 1960s are not really serious threats to the U.S. economy, but the 1970s put that argument to rest. On August 15, 1971, President Richard Nixon walks into the Oval Office, sits down before national television cameras, and says, I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. With these words, he demolishes the gold standard and shatters the post-war agreement that guarantees stable world currencies. We see oil prices doubling and tripling, long gas lines and no gas for sale, New York City sinking to the edge of outright bankruptcy, but still, the Federal Reserve does not print money wildly. Still, it grows its balance sheet slowly and gradually. So, you come up with a new argument. You say, well, all those black swan events are still not serious threats to the U.S. banking system. And maybe that's why the Fed does not do anything unusual like printing money or knocking interest rates to zero. But <laughs> the next day, the decade, the 1980s, puts that theory to shame. Between 1980 and 1991, we witnessed the failure of 1,200 savings and loans. We see the failure of 1,500 commercial banks, including Southeast Bank here in the South Florida, not to mention the Bank of New England and many, many others. The nation, shocked by images, of statewide bank shutdowns, bank holidays in Maryland and Rhode Island. But still, the Federal Reserve does not print money wildly. Still, it grows its balance sheet slowly and gradually. Ditto for the 1990s, until that is, the Y2K bug. Many people are afraid that because of a glitch in computer programs, the banking system will collapse, the power grid will go down, the economy will come to a screeching halt. And the second half of 1999, the Fed chairman himself begins to believe it.
result is this surge in money printing as you see it here. As it turns out though, Y2K is a non-event. Then he embarks on a second money printing binge in response to 9-11. But those were just the warm-ups. In 2006, President Bush appoints a new chairman of the Federal Reserve with a nickname, Helicopter Ben. It's Ben Bernanke, and he gets his nickname from his pet theory that in times of crisis, the Fed should just pour money onto the economy like $100 bills from helicopters. Now comes the real deal. Now comes the Big Bang of the 21st century. Right at that point right there. You know what happened then. That's when the event happened we talked about in the video. The Lehman failure. And then Bernanke does this. Within a few short weeks from this point to this point, he embarks on the first massive sustained money printing in the history of the US dollar. It is literally off the chart. Just that this time around, interestingly, at just about that time, I meet casually with a former chairman of the Federal Reserve, Paul Volcker. He and I happen to be at the same conference in Washington, DC, sitting together in the same lounge, talking about a dear mutual friend and about the government rescue operations. That's when he says something very unusual with no punches pulled, and I quote, Mr. Weiss, when I was chairman of the Fed, I never could have imagined in my wildest dreams that the government would ever do something like this. But that's just the beginning. This time, even after the immediate crisis dissipates, Mr. Bernanke does not take the extra money back out of the banking system. He teleports us into a new world, a world in which billions turn into trillions and a world in which all the books of monetary policy are dumped into the Potomac. For starters, he gives us a new name, quantitative easing, or QE, for printing money. And then when the first round of QE is not enough, he gives us more. And then he embarks on still more with QE2. And when QE2 is still not enough, he and his successor, Janet Yellen, give us QE3, almost as big as QE1 and QE2 put together, all told between that fateful day in 2008 when Lehman Brothers fails and today, the Fed has printed and pumped more than $3.6 trillion. That's 91 times more than they printed and pumped to offset the economic shock of 9-11 terrorist attacks. 91 times more. Initially, of course, all this money feels good, like strong pain-killing narcotics. We get cheap money and zero interest rates. We get more consumer spending. We get higher real estate prices and rising stock prices, all very endearing to some people. But in the long run, it's the invisible side effects that are more enduring. It wipes out the interest income of average American families and retirees who want to live off their savings. Or worse, it transforms them into speculators who wind up losing a portion of their principal. It pushes investors to chase yield by taking big risks. And among those investors, only a small minority can be consistent winners. Instead of paying out more in dividends or hiring more workers, it encourages big companies to buy back their own stock with borrowed cheap money. And this explains why we're now seeing a decline in capital investments by those same corporations. In fact, it's a key reason why in the first quarter of this year, we witnessed the first major plunge in capital expenditures since the Great Recession. Plus, it's why we're seeing an, one other major boom that directly impacts our community, which I want to talk about later. Right now, all of this continues. It's ongoing. But it raises an obvious question, a question that Fed, Fed Chairman Yellen is asked and probably asks herself all the time. What will happen when the wonder drug 
stops flowing into the bloodstream of our economy. That was the first setup for black swan events of the financial kind. Now let's talk about black swan setups of the second kind in the social realm. Let me restate the consequences of the Fed's money printing. Think about this. Zero interest rates. Virtually no safe yield opportunities for investors or savers. A lot of big stake speculation, but only a small minority of winners and fewer high paying jobs. All this has driven the second major mega trend of our time, the concentration of wealth. And let me add this. The concentration of wealth is no longer just about the plight of the poor, nor is it an issue limited to the nation's middle class. It's also hindering higher net worth investors from growing their portfolios by taking away money, taking away dividends, and from taking away interest income. In other words, we're not, no longer talking just about the rich squeezing out the middle class. We're also talking about America's billionaires squeezing out America's millionaires. And I'll prove it to you in just a moment. I'll prove to you that this trend has gotten a lot more extreme since the Fed began wildly printing money on September 15, 2008. Of course, the wealth concentration of America didn't begin in 2008. In fact, to get the full picture, I want to take you back nearly 100 years to the 1920s. This chart shows you how the nation's wealth is held by the, how much of the wealth, nation's wealth, what proportion is held by the nation's super rich. Not the top 1%, not the top 0.1%, but the top 0.01%. In other words, the wealthiest one in every 10,000 households. Back in the 1920s, their share of, what the, of the nation's wealth was also rising from 5% to 6% to 8%, and then to a peak of 10% in 1929. That was reversed with the Great Crash when, which wiped out the fortunes of the super-rich, and the Great Depression, which drove their business enterprises into the gutter. But jump ahead to 1978. That's when the concentration of wealth in America reaches an all-time low. And that's when it begins to rise again. Which, again, brings us to this critical point in history. 2008. The year 2008 is not just when Lehman Brothers fails, it's also the year when the wealth concentration in America matches the peak levels of another important turning point long ago, 1929. That's when inequality in America is close to what history tells us is a potential breaking point. And that's precisely when the Great Recession begins. But there's a big difference between the Great Recession of our era and the Great Depression of the 1930s. Back then, the Great Depression reduced the wealth share of the super-rich. This time, it doesn't. Instead, thanks primarily to the Fed's money printing, the concentration of wealth surges to new all-time highs never before seen in this country. And the end result is what you see here, the great social and cultural divide of America today. Regardless of your personal opinion of this megatrend, you should not be surprised if this social divide fuels powerful emotions, pride and shame, greed and envy, fear and anger, all fuel for black swan events of the social kind. And regardless of your political persuasion, you should also not be surprised when the concentration of wealth comes with this the black swan setup of a third kind, political division and dysfunction. I know, you're probably thinking, well, this last topic is strictly for cocktail hour chit chat. Or maybe you're wondering how I'm going to take this conversation beyond the typical rhetoric coming from Sanders, Clinton, or Trump, and beyond yesterday's primaries. Here's how, with this scientific, quantitative study of political divisions and dysfunctions in the United States. 
It's based on an exhaustive study of voting patterns in the U.S. House of Representatives. And as you can see, it tends to move up and down, more or less in tandem with wealth concentration. Look, when this red line over there is low, it means that Republicans and Democrats in Congress vote mostly on the issues. In other words, they cross party lines and they draft legislation together. When this line, the red line, is high, it means that our elected officials usually disregard the substance of the issues and they vote strictly along party lines. They accomplish next to nothing and they throw bricks at each other. Most people called that Washington gridlock. But that was just until this point in 2008 when the political divisions reached that level. Now it's up to the highest level of all time. With that, what, what comes out of this polarization in this polarized environment? You guessed it. We have black swan politicians surging out of the blue, gathering tremendous momentum, changing history, and dramatically shifting America's destiny. So there you have it, the three extreme megatrends of our time, the three setups for black swans in the United States, black swans of the first kind in the financial realm on your screen right now, black swans of the second kind in the social realm, black swans of the third kind in the political realm, all just setups. Each one, the side, one side of the same single pyramid, which is replicated in far greater extremes in other giant economies of the world, and each helping to drive more capital to safe haven destinations. So what is this flight capital looking for? Well, quality, very high quality. Companies with the strongest balance sheets and longest, steadiest earnings history, the highest caliber class A properties in choice locations. It's looking for safety, not just safety from financial risk, but also safety from social risk, crime and organized crime, the decline of government services, hospitals and schools. And it's looking for safety from political risk, election upsets, impeachments, coups, labor unrest, and third, Investors are almost invariably looking for one more very important thing, yield. They used to find yield in bonds, but thanks to the Fed's zero interest rates, they can't find much yield in bonds anymore. Investors also used to go for high yielding stocks, but now they can't find much good yield in stocks either. So they've piled into commercial real estate. And that's why right at this very moment, commercial real estate in the United States has seen its biggest boom of all time, even bigger than the mid 2000s. Hard to believe? Then look at this. Here's the mid 2000 boom in commercial real estate prices. That's boom number one, then the bust. And now here's the boom in commercial real estate prices we're seeing right now. Boom number two. And as I said, the 2016 boom clearly surpasses 2008. Is it a bubble? In some sectors, such as multifamily rental apartments, yes. In other sectors, perhaps not, or at least not yet. So now comes the big question that concerns us right now. Will the next black swans drive more money into our community or Will the next black swans hurt our community? I don't know. It could be a combination of both. But I leave you and myself <laughs> with one homework assignment, one word of warning, and four pieces of advice. A little bit of arithmetic here. The homework project is to fill an important gap we have in our community, education. You know, Executives of top-notch companies coming to our area want a local labor force that is highly educated, higher education. They also want solid education for their children. They want strong elementary, middle, and high schools. And that's one reason Elizabeth and I founded the Y School over a quarter of a century ago. The one word of warning is very simple. Yes. Our community is in a safe haven, one of the best in the world. 
But this is not an island. The advice is also simple. One, don't count your chickens before they're hatched. In other words, invest and expand primarily in response to real current demand for your products and your services. Not on spec, not in response to someone's, even mine, forecast of the future for future demand. That's number one. Two, avoid the bubbles. Or at least reduce your exposure. Three, invest in the quality, not quantity. Get there before all that flight money comes in and you'll do even better. A plus rated stocks, class A commercial properties in choice locations. Four, this is the last one, prepare for the black swans with cash, plenty of cash in reserve to protect yourself from the unexpected. Thank you. This is the best presentation I have ever heard, bar none. And for once in 16 years, I have no questions. <laughs>
and that's why it's so attractive. But you know, you can't walk into the into Publix and, and exchange your gold bar, especially the big heavy ones, for for popcorn. So, <laughs> so um, a small proportion, you know, five, ten percent of your money. And for now, don't worry about your cash being devalued, because, like I said, it's much worse overseas. And so the value of the dollar has been going up and is holding very firm. Yes, sir. I'm curious on the social unrest and the relation of wealth disparity. Um, as we move into this unknown territory of you know, the next year or two, um, is there any historical data in the United States that has a similar type of flavor that can kind of give us an idea of what could happen? So the question is social unrest. How do we forecast based on past historical data? How do you forecast you know, uprisings or demonstrations or, or violence outside the convention like we saw in Chicago? Um, you don't. You know, econo economics itself is just a throw of the dice again. Uh, social forecasting, forget it. So you, you can't forecast it. That's, that's why it's, it's kind of in the, in the realm of black swan events. And you just have to roll with the punches when it comes. Yeah. How does technology factor into your black swans? Involved? How does technology factor in? Well, it's actually one of the explanations as to why they've been able to print money uh, and not see the inflation, because technology is very, an, an, very much an anti-inflation positive force in the economy. So that has also been a, a help. And that's one of the big bright lights at the end of the tunnel if we go into a tunnel. Technology uh, survived very nicely, and the ideas behind technology survived very nicely throughout all of those bad events that we saw in the videos. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Oh, you're just going like that. Okay. And someone is creeping up the ladder. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's my signal. OK. <laughs> yes? When are interest rates going up? When are interest rates going up? <laughs> that, you and he should get together. And <laughs> it's, part of the same, uh, it's part of the same complex. Um, <laughs> are, you, are you wanting interest rates to go up, or are you wanting them to stay down? What, where are you, and what's your agenda here? Everybody's waiting for that answer, I guess. Uh, no, but what would you like to see happen? Which, Steady increase, but not, not a surge. I think, I think the Fed would like to see the same thing, but they, they just can't, haven't figured out how to do it. Because they're so worried that they're going to remove from the economy that wonder drug. And even if they do it dra gradually, they're worried about the consequences. Yes, sir, in the red shirt. Every one of these events that I've been to seems to come back around with the statement of saying we need to do more for education. And I applaud you for what you have done, sir. But I have yet to hear a plan come together from any of these organizations, these groupings of, we all say we need better education, that's what's bringing people in. We have two of the top world research facilities here with Scripps and Michael Wong that are now just starting to be fed from FAU right here in our backyard at the uh, Honor College. We, what can we do to stimulate all of this? I have a plan for a plan. It's not a plan, it's a plan for a plan. And that is that um, after I get down from the podium, we sit down and put together a PGA committee on education. What do you say? 